graduated from medical school, I decided to go into pediatrics rather than lots of other options like cardiology or surgery or OBGYN, all of which are interesting. But I chose pe pediatrics basically because I loved falling in love with my patients. And you can do that in pediatrics. Also, my hospital served a section of New York City where life was hard. Um, the neighborhoods there were weighed down by poverty and crime and violence. And I mean, most of the families were broken families. Um, and the children who would come to the hospital to be my patients um, clearly were in as much need of love as they were of medical care. And I loved being able to give them both. Being a hospital-based pediatrician allowed me to do something else I loved, which was being present at birth. I never tired of seeing birth happen. It was just such an amazing event, and I felt very privileged to witness it, uh, either in a delivery room or like here in the OR for C-section. But also fascinated me to realize that we all start off life and this tiny speck, a single cell, too small for the human eye to see, that has a, somehow this mysterious spark ignited in it, leading or initiating this process of constructing a human body. But out of what? Just out of molecules siphoned off from the mother's blood and slowly but surely constructing a human body using those molecules to assemble all the, the different organs and tissues and complex structures that make up our bodies. And finally, that body reaching a point of development where it's able to exist in the world outside the mother, and then being squeezed down this impossibly narrow tunnel <laughs> and popping out like this. Just a brand new human being. I just always felt that this was uh, just a miraculous process, and, and indeed it is. And over the 20 years of working in my hospital, I looked into the eyes literally of tens of thousands of these newly arrived human beings. Um, just each one was unique and just there ready to begin the human journey. And to me, there was just something quite miraculous about that. At the other end of the human journey, there's something else that, to me, has an element of the mystery and the miraculous about it, and that is dying. And it was Christina, who, um, one of many, who made that very clear. So Christina was a four-year-old child who had um, acquired AIDS at birth from her mother. Her mother had subsequently died, and Christina was being raised by a foster mother, a really wonderful woman. And this was back in the 1980s, when we really didn't understand what AIDS was. And AIDS was just going through the inner city neighborhoods in New York like a wildfire. And we lost many children, many infants, to AIDS in those days. And um, I can't believe I still get choked up about that. But um, Christina, as was typical of children of AIDS, would get these recurring infections and fevers and, uh, that their immune systems couldn't deal with. And so she would have to come into the hospital, um, and we would hook her up to uh, IV antibiotics. And Two days she would be feeling much better, and as soon as she was, Christina would be out of bed, walking around the ward with her IV pole, just full of curiosity, looking into the other rooms to see what children were there, and tugging on the sleeves of doctors and nurses. And um, she was just the, this little beam of light, twinkling light, on the ward, and um, everybody loved her. They just couldn't help. But the time came when an infection 
settled into her lungs that we couldn't get rid of. And um, we knew we were going to lose her. And the last night, the last night of her life, I sat with her foster mother beside her bed all through that night. And I really didn't need to be there. There wasn't anything medical to do at that point. But I, I just wanted to. I wanted to see her life right up to the end and, and bid her goodbye. Um, so, some point after midnight, when Christina took her last breath, and another breath didn't follow, the most amazing thing happened. The room became filled with this silence, this deep silence. Uh, it wasn't just an absence of noise, other sounds. It was really something that filled the room and was almost like a presence. And there was a, a tangible feeling of peace and even blessing present in that silence. Um, that was such a profound experience that um, it added to my interest and determination to, to pay more attention to the dying process and learn what it could teach. Paula was someone I learned from many years later when I began working with adults who were um, at, with terminal illness. And Paula was a character. She had left home at age 12 and taken to the streets in New York because her mother was abusive and alcoholic, and Paula lived the typical life of a street person, surviving the way street people do. And um, by the time Paula was 54, her love liver was really um, pretty sick um, from all the, the drugs she had been doing, and alcohol, and the AIDS she had acquired along the way. And so um, Paula. Well, her liver was really failing, and Paula went into liver failure coma. She was in coma for two weeks in my hospital. And then, interestingly, her liver kicked back in, and Paula woke up. And Paula said, no, I learned something while I was away in that coma. I, I learned that I'd been running from something all my life. And what had I been running from? I'd been running from myself. And it was no surprise because Paula had been told all her life that she was nothing but a worthless piece of dog dung. And um, Paula said, I wonder if that's really true. Maybe it's not. And so Paula agreed to come off the streets and enter a, a um, home for homeless people with AIDS. It was right across the street from my hospital. And to so Paula's surprise, she found that the other residents there liked her, the staff liked her, and she liked being there, liked having her own room and a comfortable bed and regular meals to have. And Paula became somewhat of a philosopher at the group home. She, the other residents enjoyed coming to her and telling her their problems, and she had wise things to say. Meanwhile, you know, the social worker had been doing some detective work to see if she could locate any relatives of Paula. And she did. She found a, an aunt and uncle living in Kentucky. And she called this aunt and uncle, and they were just amazed. Well, Paula's alive. She'd given her up for dead long ago. And he said, is there any way she could come and pay us a visit? Because they were too elderly to travel. And so this intrepid social worker scraped together the funds to buy Paula a round trip ticket and send her down to see her aunt and uncle for three days. And so Paula, who had never been out of New York City in her life, was taken to the airport, put on a plane, and she flew down to Kentucky. She called the social worker later that day and said, thank you so much. I just never realized what it was like to have family and to, to be loved by people who 
The only reason they love you is just because they feel connected to you as family. Um, and Paul was learning a lot about friendship and family. Um, the next day, Paul had developed a fever and went to the hospital and was admitted. And the third day, Paul had died. And everyone at the group home was like, what? She died? And how could that have happened? And this one guy, this really old guy, gruff guy, just stood up and said, well, if any of us could have managed to, as our last act of life, gotten on a plane and flown away, that would have been Paula. <laughs> and so it's stories like this that made me feel over the years that dying is a mystery. And, and in our culture where we push it away and resist it and see it as the enemy, um, perhaps we're missing something. We're missing the opportunity to learn and receive gifts and discover new things before life comes to an end. Definitely my patients taught me that. Thank you very much.